I have been looking forward to this sermon for several weeks. You know, we went through all of the Beatitudes, and the description there is basically that God's person, God's follower, is going to be far different than the rest of the world. And oftentimes, when we are so different uh, from the world, what, how does the world view us? They begin to persecute. They begin to think that we're nuts. They begin to want to shy away from us. And Jesus is telling us that we are the salt of this world. We are the light in this world. And he uses these two uh, synonyms, not synonyms, uh, no, uh, no, ah, it's a metonymy, uh, not homonyms. Oh, anyway, we need an English teacher to come help us today. Uh, similitudes, that'll work. These two similitudes, what, what your life is like salt. Your life is like light in the world. Citizens of the kingdom have to be entirely different, even at the cost of losing popularity. Now, I don't know if you can tell on here, but here you would think perhaps it would be easier for us to go out of the world, maybe cloister together in a convent, or maybe go off to a a monastery, and there we could live separate and apart from the world since we are so different. But Jesus said, no, you need to live in this world. Not only are we to live in this world, but we have to influence this world. Despite the bitterness, despite the slanderous treatment that we might receive on a daily basis. We are to re receive our blessing after this life is over, realizing that for now we may not have a blessing in this world. When you think about it, we are this world's only hope. We are the preserving nature of this world. We are the ones who bring the light of Christ into the world. It is up to us. We live in this world, but we are not of this world. We're not like this world. We live here, but we act differently. Jesus never intended for his disciples to remove themselves out of the world and to live separate from the world. He taught us and he showed us through his own example over and over again that he was going to be with the people. I always liked the little uh, story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up. Remember what his occupation was? He was a tax collector. And the people didn't like him, and therefore uh, they, they kind of eschewed him. They didn't want to be around him. And you remember as, as he was walking by, he looked up and he saw Zacchaeus in the tree. And what did he say? Come down from there, for I'm going to your house to eat. Well, that really bothered the scribes and the Pharisees of the day. They would say, look at this man. He receives sinners. He receives publicans. He receives all of the outcasts of society. Surely he cannot be God's chosen. Jesus' example was to go where the people needed him. Remember, he said, I didn't come to seek and to save those who are saved, but those who are lost. He didn't come to a people who didn't need to be cured. He came as the physician to change the world. If you'll notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, Christians, if, if we were going to not be affected by the world, we'd have to leave this world. So while we're here, we have to live in such a way to change the things that are around about us. And the only way that we can do that is to live a Christ-like life and change the world. 
In John chapter 17 and verse 6 through 18, Jesus' disciples are to live in this world, but not like this world. Remember, Jesus said, you have given me these people in John chapter 17, but they are not of this world. Just like he is not of this world, we are not of this world. Jesus then goes on to tell us, by the way, do you notice the graphic? That's a light bulb shaker of salt. That took me a long time to make that. So y'all really appreciate that, okay? Thank you. <laughs> he says, you are the salt of the earth in verse chapter 5 and verse 13. Salt has a lot of different properties uh, that were even more important in the first century than they are now. In first century Palestine, they had to have salt in order to preserve their food. They didn't have refrigeration like we do. So they would salt their meat. In fact, uh, William Barclay actually said of the Romans that they had a saying, there is nothing more useful than sun and salt. I remember growing up that when we would pick peaches, we would slice them and lay them out on top of the zinc sheet at the barn, or galvanized sheet in the barn. And I thought, well, that doesn't seem very good because the birds fly over and the bugs and everything, but the sun would dry them out, and then we would have dried fruit all winter long. I remember putting up hams and how we would have to rub the, the salt and sugar into those hams, and then Dad would put them in an old refrigerator and with a smoker thing going. But it was amazing how salt preserves things. How many of you like jerky? A lot of people, the thing they like most about jerky is how salty it is, right? <laughs> jerky is probably not the best thing for us to be eating. Jesus used these common things to illustrate that life is like salt. You and I preserve and we purify this world. So we need to talk this morning about how different we look. When you think about it, the people who would follow Jesus are the most unlikely people to influence the world. Who were the followers of Jesus? The poor, the prostitute, the publican, the sinners, people who, who had very little influence in the world, but Jesus is saying you have the power because you are the salt. You are the preservation of everything that God has given. You preserve this world. I am convinced that when Christians stop influencing the world, that the world will be done. You'll remember that Christians have come out of the world. Sin has corrupted this world. It has polluted this world. In 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse number 4, we see that Christians have what? Escaped from the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desire. Corruption, the thing that's destroying this world, is sinful lusts. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. That's what's destroying this world. And he's saying, you have escaped that through Jesus Christ. And as a result, you shine in this world like light in a dark place. We need to realize that the world is a slave to corruption. Whatever overcomes a person, that's his enslavement. That's his master. Sin promises you a good time, but what does it do? Destroys you. The wages of sin is what? Death. And that's what he's telling us. We need to realize that death is a horrible thing while we're still alive in this world. We're dead because of sin. We as Christians have died to sin. Christians escape corruption through Christ and thereby, thereby through the power of Christ, we purify and preserve those round about us. I'm convinced that godly Christian parents raise godly Christian children. I'm convinced that godly 
Christian bosses influence their employees to be godly Christian people. If they don't allow cussing and drinking and gambling and those kinds of things on the job site, he has fixed that problem in the world, right? And shouldn't Christian employers, the Christian employees, be different in the world? Who would you rather work for? A good Christian boss who's going to treat you the way that Christ says we ought to treat each other? Or somebody who is of the world and is going to try to cheat you out of everything? Christians are different in every way from the world. We are to be pure in speech. I love the, the, uh, what Paul says in Colossians chapter 4. He says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. We temper our speech. Do you say everything that comes to your mind? You better not. <laughs> everything that comes to your mind, you, you have to temper that. You can't just let fly everything that comes to your mind and comes out of your heart. Christians have tempered that with the message of truth. In fact, we are, and we're going to talk about this tonight in our sermon on evangelism, we, we need to be people who talk about different things than the world talks about. And it ought to be very natural for people to know that when they're around me, we're going to talk about spiritual things. But that's tonight's lesson. But notice also in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse number 29, he says, Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only... Things that are good for encouraging, for building up, as fits the occasion. It's up to us to say the right thing at the right time. Now here's one that seems like the world hasn't caught on to yet. Christians, or Christians haven't caught on to yet. We are identifiable by the things that we wear. Do you believe that? I believe there are certain t-shirts and slogans that I shouldn't wear. I remember when I was sixth grade, I remember I bought a t-shirt that had a Milky Way bar, a Snicker bar, French fries, and something else on it. And they were all playing musical instruments. And it was the band called the Munchies. And I thought that was the greatest t-shirt in the world. Until my mom told me what the munchies are and how you get them, and she wouldn't let me wear that shirt. She said a good Christian boy would not advertise that he has the munchies. You know, you can tell the difference between an apple and an orange, can't you? How do you tell? By the way, they're just covered up. Compare these two passages. In Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 10, the scripture says, And behold, the woman meets him dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. How can you tell a prostitute? By the way they dress. Very alluring. Very sexual in nature. But notice in 1 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 9, he says, Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty, with self-control, with not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. I'm not saying that you have to wear a floor-length dress all the time and not wear makeup and things like that. That's not what we're saying. But you can tell the difference between somebody, some lady, some sister in Christ who is trying to live for God and one who is trying to catch a man and trying to bring on them the, the alluring eye of somebody. We must be careful. And we say that to women, but you know what? Men can be just as guilty. We need to be very careful with how we dress and what vibes we give off to the world. Purity in dress separates us from the world. Then purity and behavior. I like Titus chapter 
2 and verse 6. He says, likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled, to show yourselves in all respects, to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, show dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. Now notice, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. You see, we live in such a way that no one can say, look at what that Christian is doing. Why would I want to be a Christian? If they're acting just like I am, why would I want to be a Christian? Why would I want to wear the name Christian when they're sinning the same way that I am? And notice also in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak blasphemy against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. What's he saying? Live differently. Behave in such a way that, that it doesn't give an opportunity for somebody to slander God because you're living differently than what the Bible tells us to live. There was a woman by the name of Tabitha in Acts chapter 9 and verse 36. She was identifiable because she was full of good works and acts of charity. We do this not to be seen of the world for the applause of men. Oh, look at all the money that person gives to the good of the world. Look at all the time they're spending at this. We're doing this for the glorification of God, not for the glorification of us. This is not my opportunity to say, look at me, but rather look at God. And then also, we are to live in such a way, let's go on past, that we are pure in appearance. I'm convinced that it's not always what you do that causes people to think bad. But it's the things that you seem to do. Not, not necessarily that you would do something bad, but you would leave the impression that you would do something bad. And oftentimes that has to do to the places that you go, the kind of job that you would hold. Things that would identify us with the world. We're supposed to be above reproach. I can't go to the liquor store and buy even medicinal alcohol. Why? Because most likely the place would have caught on fire and the news would be there and they would say the North Loop Church of Christ preacher was at the liquor store and he was buying hooch. Not only that, but we never know who might be there that we could cause to stumble. So even though we may not be doing something that's wrong, if it has the appearance of being wrong, we should stay away from it. Be very careful with not only what you say, but also what you do. Salt that's not salty. Jesus says that once salt has lost its saltiness, it's good for nothing. And I love this idea. What would you do if tomorrow somebody gave you an elephant? <laughs> Kelsey says, yay! But what would you do with it? What, what good is an elephant other than saying, look, I have an elephant? It becomes a burden, doesn't it? An elephant having to feed it, having to clean up after it. This is not a chihuahua we're talking about. We're talking about an elephant. And they make a mess. It becomes the proverbial albatross tied around our neck. When we have lost our 
ability to do good in the world because we've lost our reputation, because we are just like the world. Jesus said, you are of no use to me. We're like this elephant. We're like the albatross. What is sad is that there are many Christians who have become useless in the kingdom of the Lord. And what do you do with those folks? Where are they going to turn? They become a dead weight even in the church. I have worked at places, and I, I thank God that it's not this place, where people say, oh, you're the preacher at that church. I remember a deacon that ran off with the secretary. I remember a preacher that did such and such, and, and there was such a bad reputation of the members there that we had no influence in the community, and it tied our hands. And it would take years to rebuild a reputation in that community. So it's very important that Joe Schmo, church member, behaves himself in the right way so that the church has a good reputation amongst all men. The Bible says that the person who turns away having known the truth, if he turns away from it, then it's worse for him than had he never started off. The end of that person is much worse than having never obeyed and never turned toward God in righteousness. We need to guard ourselves against the defilement of impurity and lose the influence of this world. Becoming defiled by what? By lusts, by unholy action, by unholy activity. Do you remember Esau? His problem was that he wanted earthly things instead of spiritual things. And you and I can fall into that category very easily. We should have such a hatred for sin and everything about sin that if, if we see someone who is running that way or, or leaning towards sinfulness, we would snatch them out of the fire so afraid that they might fall, hating even the garment that's stained by the flesh. We don't want them to, to even get close to losing their salvation. And that includes my heart. That includes your heart. I'm watching out for you. You're watching out for me. Jesus tells us that it's not the outside of man, but it's the heart that defiles us. It's what we think, what we're constantly about in our mind every day that causes us to bad thing, do bad things. Evil things come from within and they defile us. Lusts, the desire of the eye, the desires of the flesh, those are the things that defile us. And so Jesus is saying, be the salt to preserve the world that, that you living the way that you are living will change this world. Then he goes on and changes uh, the metaphor. There's the word I was looking for changes the metaphor to light from salt to light and he says you are the light of the world and he starts off by reminding us that the world is full of darkness whenever the bible uses darkness it describes distress despair gloom sorrow fear especially fear of death we don't live in fear we don't live in distress. We don't live in gloom. We don't live in darkness. And surely we don't live in fear because we know that God's way is the way. Jesus has lighted our path and we're not afraid to go. Do you live in darkness? If you're living in sin, if you're living in iniquity, if you're living in transgression, all of those being words of different types of sin, we have to guard ourselves. We can turn off our own lights by living contrary to the light. Darkness is not knowing the word of God. Not knowing the will of God. The reason we struggle so much with doing what is right is because we don't know what is right. Do you remember Jeremiah said that it's not within man to direct his own steps. That we have to go beyond ourselves. We have to go to the one 
who made us in order to know what is right for us. In fact, there is a way that seems right to us, but the end thereof is destruction. We may think we're doing right, but if it's not uh, based upon God's will, then we are wandering around in darkness, not being able to do what is right. Here is the whole description of what darkness is about. Notice in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding. They are alienated from the life of God. You see, it's so strange to them to do what is right. This is a whole new way of living. It's, it's like speaking another language because they don't get it. Why? Because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. When we don't let God's word penetrate and change us, we're still in darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. Please underline the idea that he is the light, not a light. Jesus brings light to darkness, to despair, to sorrow, to sin. Jesus changes the world. Jesus is the light of the world. He's the perfect example of what God is looking for in us. Jesus is the one we are, as Peter says, we are to follow in his steps because he has blazed the trail for us on how we are to live and be pleasing to God. He's the example of love. He's the example of righteousness. He's the example of good works that would shine out in a dark, decaying world. Christians are the reflection of the light of Christ. So we are the light of the world. Jesus shining through us. And the world sees God by the things that we live each and every day. Christians reflect God's goodness. Christians reflect the holiness of speech. The holiness of behavior. Remember, Peter says, be holy. Why? Because God is holy. And if we're going to come into the presence of God, we need to be holy as well. Notice that Paul says again in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, to let your light shine out in darkness. Let your heart be given to the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You'll never shine brightly if you don't have Jesus at the core of your being. Our light reflects the influence. The light that we shine into the dark places changes the world. I like the idea that Peter brings up. He says, you, you wives who have an unbelieving husband, I want you to live in such a way that they are converted by your chaste behavior. By how good you are, how loving you are, how kind you are, how you put God first in your life, that that would change his thinking as well. And that goes for men too. That goes for unbelieving children too, doesn't it? Can't we influence our children to become? We can't give up. I mean, none of us can force our children to be good. If that was the case, none of us would have children that were bad, right? We can't force them. But we could put the love of God in front of them so long that they will eventually say, hey, what I'm doing is destroying me. I want to be like dad. I want to be like mom who has the joy of Christianity. I want that kind of a life. And they'll turn back. So Peter says, let your life convert your unbelieving husband. How often are we to shine? Jesus said, you don't take a light and hide it under a bushel. But instead, you put it on a lampstand. So that everyone in the house has benefit from the light. So your Christianity cannot be something that is hidden from view. It's something that everyone sees in you, even when it's going to cost 
persecution, even when people are going to make fun of you, even when people are going to ridicule you, mock you, or whatever else, you still have to be a faithful child of God in front of all people. I think you need to be careful with your own church family. Remember in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25? He said we are to spur one another on to love and good works, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together and to encourage one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. We need to be encouraging one another by our own godly commitment to Christ. We need to not let our lights go out. Wouldn't it be terrible to know that at the end of the world, we would enter into a place of darkness forever? So I leave you with this last passage. He says, I want you to be blameless, innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in this world. Is your light shining? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm going to let it shine. Every day. And everywhere that I go, the world is going to be seasoned with the blessings of Christ. And I'm going to change the ugliness of the things that are going on around me to being what God wants them to be. I love this sermon. We could go on for another hour, but we're not going to. I have a big question for you this morning. Are you living right now as God has asked you to live? Is your light dimmed because there's something in your life standing between you and the light of God shining in your life? You need to change that. You need to get rid of whatever it is between you and God today. If you're not a child of God, if you have not... Put him on in baptism. Today is the day to change that. Today is the day to fix that and become a true child of God. If there's sin somewhere in your life, and only you know that answer, today is the day to get it.